Whenever a new video game movie gets announced, I'm always skeptical about it. And for with good reason. I mean, we've all been burned before with prior movies based on our favorite franchises. And every time there's a new announcement for a new video game movie or a movie based off a video game, I think to myself, how are they going to ruin my childhood today? But things have been different recently. I mean, we had Detective Pikachu, which just completely changed how video game movies are made. And then that was followed up with Sonic. And while Sonic at first did receive some sort of backlash because, let's be honest, it was made of nightmares, they went ahead and they fixed that. And the movie was enjoyable. It felt like I was in the Sonic world, but just watching it instead of playing it. And it felt like a good movie. It was a lot of fun to watch that movie, especially with my kids. Well, Resident Evil has been one of those movie franchises that just always seems to miss the mark. Yeah, we have the Paul Anderson films, and let's be honest, the first movie was decent, not the best. And the second movie, it was a lot of fanfare service, and I appreciate that. And I actually had a lot of fun watching the second movie. Granted, there was a lot of issues, you know, mainly Jill, right? Like, Jill got no way to shine in that movie. Except for her entrance to the movie, which was fantastic in the RPD. But outside of that, Jill really didn't do much in the movie. And then the third movie, it just started getting weird from there. And even though the third movie, I still did enjoy it. It just didn't feel like Resident Evil anymore. And then from that point on, it was just who knows what the hell they did with that. But then we come to Welcome to Raccoon City. And when the movie first got announced, I was a little bit excited for it just because they said, oh, we're going back to the roots of Resident Evil. We're going to go and do a proper version of, of an adaptation for this movie. And to be honest, when I saw the casting announcements, I was confused. I felt like Robbie Amell was a perfect choice for Chris Redfield. I could see him as Chris Redfield, and he had the look for it, and he's actually a decent actor. If you've ever seen him in other things besides, you know, I guess the DC CW universe or the Arrowverse, he actually has some good acting chops to him. He can play the the goofy kind of uh, kind of role. He can do a you know a tough guy kind of role, and he he's just overall he's got some, he's got a good future with him. Besides him, I was confused with the rest of the cast. Like Jill, I felt was a decent option. The actress, she's a good actress. So I was looking forward to seeing her portrayal of Jill. But Leon made me feel weird because it was very jarring the way that they decided to change his character. And for better or worse, if it was a good portrayal of Leon, I would have been okay with that. But... The rest of the cast, like William Birkin and Albert Wesker, I think the choice for Wesker initially when I first saw it was a decent enough choice. He was great in Umbrella uh, Umbrella Academy, and the actor who, play, who portrays William Birkin is a phenomenal actor as well. But just seeing the casting choices between the two, I already knew that they weren't going to follow the story for William Birkin and Albert Wesker because in the games... Albert Wesker and William Birkin, they worked together. They were both researchers working for Umbrella. And because of the age difference of those two actors, I already knew they were not going to follow that. So, okay, now that that was already set up, we got to see some teaser photos, and the teaser photos looked good. We saw the uh, how the RPD looked on the outside. It looked like the RPD from the games. We saw how... The mansion looked on the inside as far as the main hall was, and it looked like the main hall for the game. We saw stills of Chris Redfield. He looked like Chris Redfield. You know, like, it, it, it was starting to look decent enough. Well, the movie finally came out, and I watched it. I watched it opening day, and we're going to discuss this. We're going to talk about it. We're going to... This is going to be a, a, an in-depth, complete breakthrough, breakdown, whatever, of the movie. There will be spoilers, okay, so I'll let you guys know when the spoilers are coming up, but before we get into the spoilers, we're going to just discuss the overall 
feel of the movie, how I felt about watching the movie. So, without further ado, let's get to it. As I mentioned before, set pieces play a big a big factor in this movie. Uh, the RPD, the outside, look like the RPD. The inside is modeled after the RE2 and RE3 remake of the RPD. And by that, I mean just the first main entrance. When you first enter the RPD, you see the desk there. It looks like the RPD from the remakes, not RE2 original, which is fine by me. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, it looks... It looks good. It looks like it does in the most recent entries of the game. Cool. Awesome. The Spencer Mansion, when they first walk into it, looks like the Spencer Mansion. It, it has the look and feel of it. Awesome. Did a fantastic job with that on the set pieces. The overall feel of the Spencer Mansion, I feel like they did a phenomenal job with it. It felt like a real-life mansion. And the lighting effects that they had throughout the mansion segments of the movie. They did a, a really good job with that. I was happy to see that, and I was happy to be able to, I guess, pretty much experience that on the big screen at, from the movie, to, uh, or from the video game itself. Uh, outside of that, they also had the orphanage from RE2 Remake, and it looked like the orphanage from RE2 Remake. They, from shot for shot and the the entry the entryway to the orphanage looked like the entryway to the orphanage in RE2 remake it looked great they all the easter eggs they had so many easter eggs in this movie that honestly I'd have to watch it over and over again to be able to pick them all up and I'm not going to do that until we get a home release of the movie because I'm not paying to go see the movie over and over again I will just wait until the home release comes, and I'll explain why as we get through the uh, the process of this. Um, characters, like the way that they dressed up the characters, the way that they looked, I thought for the most part it was fine. Uh, they did a decent enough job with some issues here and there. So we have... Leon, who looks like a cheap cosplay version of Leon. I mean, he's got the RPD outfit, but he doesn't look like Leon. And that's an issue that we've said many, many times. I personally felt like he looked like Carlos, dressed up in the RPD uniform. And we're going to get into that, too, as we get into the character breakdown for each character. Wesker looked like Wesker, but not look like Wesker. And, you know, he was missing his iconic sunglasses, which they do explain in the movie. But outside of that, I mean, he, I, I guess it was okay. I mean, if you showed me an image of him and you said, who is he? Like he's playing a video game character. If it didn't say stars anywhere on him, I wouldn't guess Wesker. Chris Redfield, on the other hand, looked like Chris Redfield. Like he looked like they they got a still image of Chris Redfield from the game, and that was him. You could tell that's Chris Redfield. He looked like Chris Redfield, and again, if you showed me a picture of him, I'd say that's Chris Redfield. Claire, on the other hand, looked like Claire, but from remake. So RE2 remake Claire, not original Claire, which I'm okay with. That doesn't bother me at all. She looked like. RE2 remake Claire, but her portrayal was very different, and we'll get into that. Uh, the other characters, too, like uh, Sherry, I mean, she obviously doesn't wear Sherry's outfit in the movie, and I can see why, because Sherry's outfit would have been a little odd to see. It just, it didn't, it wouldn't fit the aesthetic of the movie. And then you have Chief Irons, where Chief Irons looks like Chief Irons, kind of, but more so like a, a suburban cop, if you can imagine that, I guess. Um, William Birkin, I mean, outside of calling him William Birkin, he doesn't look anything like William Birkin, but again, that has to deal with the fact that he looks like, an, he, I mean, he is an older version of William Birkin instead of a younger version of William Birkin. Uh, Lisa Trevor, 
actually looks really good i like the way i was skeptical skeptical at first because when i saw the initial stills of lisa trevor they looked weird but they cleaned up the way that uh, i guess you know with the lighting and the you know looking at at it through the through the film perspective she looked really good they went with practical uh, makeup on her instead of cgiing her which i really really appreciate because the cgi was very bad in the in the movie i want to say the game the game cgi to be honest looks better than the cgi in the movie um we've we've all seen it in the trailers we've seen the the cgi on the dogs on the liquors and uh it's not good um when i first saw the cgi the cgi in the trailers you know a lot of people in the comments on my videos were like oh well the cgi is not done yet wait till it's done it'll look better no it looks bad it looks really really bad um actually the dogs in i dare i say this the dogs in the paul anderson movie looked better because for the most part the dogs in the paul anderson movie outside of some you know some spots but they were more practical effect looking um you know like meaty and all that stuff like we're in this one they just it just it just didn't look good looked way way out of place with the way the cgi was like uh and i understand that the budget wasn't really big on this movie but it just it just did not look good and then the liquor when the liquor wasn't moving fast the liquor looked fine but once the liquor started moving it looked bad the cgi was really bad and i don't know if if any sort of motion capture would have would have uh, been in the budget but I, maybe they should have hand, hired andy circus to do motion capture for the liquor or something i don't i don't know it, it just it just didn't feel right and uh yeah but um, let's go ahead we're gonna talk about the movie we're gonna talk about the story uh, and then the characters. So those of you guys who don't want to be spoiled for anything, go ahead and skip to uh, later on in the video. I will put the timestamps for you guys. And let's get to it. I have a lot of bullet points to talk about here. I took a lot of notes. Um, so yeah, let's let's go ahead and get to it. Spoiler warnings. We'll we'll meet you guys at the end of this video. So the movie starts off in the orphanage. And like I said, the orphanage is RE2 Remake Orphanage. Um, there's a lot of Easter eggs in the orphanage. There's the Easter eggs all over the place. And one of the things that they, the directors and everybody else was, you know, so, so excited for hyping up so much worth all the Easter eggs in the movies. And while that's, or in the movie, and while that's fine, the issue is that you spend so much time in the Easter eggs, but you, you, you should have spent more time in the writing and in the character writing specifically. Um... Now, while Resident Evil overall isn't really strong on the character perspective or the character point of view, when you're talking about a movie, you want the characters to have some sort of development because there is character development in the games, but it, it's spanned over a couple of games, to be honest with you. Like uh, the character development for Chris Redfield, for example. While Chris is a ace marksman, he can fly uh, helicopters and planes and all that stuff. He doesn't really get his resolve until Code Veronica, where he loses to Wesker, and then he gets his resolve and he decides that he wants to start training. So that way, when when he has his interaction with uh, Wesker again, he's better prepared for it. Um, in this game. Or in this game, in this movie, uh, Chris and Claire, they don't have a brother-sister relationship. It's very, very weird to see because in the games, they have a very close relationship together. Where in this movie, it alludes to it in the beginning that they have a close relationship as they are both orphans. And uh, Chris is looking out for her, for his sister that all goes out the window in like the first five minutes because Claire and Chris have been separated for a long time and Chris sees Claire as a nuisance more than anything uh, like a drifter and that she you know can't hold a job or anything like that um, so the 
the movie after the orphanage opens up with the title card which is a nice easter egg to the original game they use the original font for the for the very first resident evil game which is that red kind of uh kind of impact lettering um and it, it just stands out and it's nice i really appreciated seeing that the uh, the scene then changes to the bar the local bar um it shows uh it shows Raccoon City as a whole, and Raccoon City is not a city. It's a town. They they downscaled the city completely, which I didn't like. Because if you're talking about a movie that you're you're gonna be basing it heavily off of RE2, and you're calling it Welcome to Raccoon City, and the city is like maybe five minutes of the movie and like when you give an aerial shot of the city it's a town like it's clearly a town if you look at re2 from the uh, wes anderson movie the second movie and you look at the aerial shot that they did for uh, for raccoon city in that movie versus the aerial shot in this movie it is complete night and day the city in the uh the uh paul anderson movie looks like a city where this one doesn't it, it's just a, a a suburban town like a small town with a small uh police station and all that stuff and you you can clearly see it as the movie continues forward we see the group or with well, the group we see uh wesker and jill at the bar at the diner whatever they're eating they're joking around and they see leon is like snoring at the uh at the counter and before this we they showed leon um as he was waking up and, and getting ready and all that stuff and they kind they showed that he is a drunk i'm kind of like jumping a, a little bit here i kind of skipped ahead but um they show that leon is you know he drinks himself silly or whatever like to you know because maybe he's bored all the time i don't know leon's character is not well written at all and I, well, I do like that they keep that he is alluded to be an alcoholic because in the games he's alluded to be an alcoholic, um, at least until RE2 Remake happened. Uh, you know, they they ruined Leon's character just overall through the entire story. Or through the entire movie, I should say. Um, so, Claire is coming into the city. She's been hitchhiking. She hitchhiked into, uh, into the tanker. Or the the truck that has the fuel tanker uh, that crashes in the games, uh, which they do keep the uh, the burger eating part, which was was kind of funny just to see it because I mean it just looks so disgusting in RE2 remake and it, it's equally disgusting in this movie uh, just to see him eating that uh, uh, that burger. They keep the moment where he he runs into the the woman that's you know crossing the street but he doesn't get bit by the zombie instead the dog eats blood or licks blood from the zombie and then the dog transforms into the cerberus and bites him um but that was after he separated from claire claire went over to uh to chris's house broke into his house and um and then we get that interaction between chris and claire where claire is a nuisance chris is like i don't want to hear any of the con these conspiracy theories um so yeah yeah they keep that and then they they have ben in the movie which is cool ben is uh the reporter in re2 remake but uh in this one he's not a reporter he's like a conspiracy theorist for raccoon city and he made friends with claire and so he was giving claire the information and he disappeared and so that's what led claire to go back to raccoon city uh so we find out that Birkin runs the orphanage that uh, like he was put in charge by Umbrella to run the orphanage to get children to experiment on. Uh, we're introduced to Lisa Trevor in the orphanage um, in the beginning of the movie. And uh, Lisa knows Claire because she used to visit Claire, uh, scared the crap out of her, but she used to visit Claire. And um, so, yeah. The other thing they get rid of is that Leon is not late to his first day. Apparently, he's been at Raccoon City for a little bit. He's he's not a rookie cop, but he's a rookie to Raccoon City, so they just call him rookie. And and on top of that, he's like I said, he's a mess. He's an absolute mess. He doesn't know how to use weapons. 
Like, how are you a cop and you don't know how to use a shotgun? But he doesn't know how to use a shotgun. And he's he's just a mess. A mess of a character. Very unlikable. And doesn't really do anything for the story, to be honest. I could talk about this whole thing. And you can take Leon out of the entire movie. And it wouldn't change the movie at all. So, Leon was transferred from another precinct in another city to Raccoon City. Uh, because his dad has connections. And yeah, that's that's how he ends up there. Uh, so they get a an alert or they get a call um, at Raccoon or at the RPD that they found a chewed up body near the Spencer mansion and that they sent Bravo team to go and investigate it. Uh, so that's that's good to see that there's Bravo team in there. But Bravo team consists of two people, Enrico and one other person who I don't remember remember the name of. Uh, Alpha team consists of Chris, Jill, Wesker, Brad Vickers, and I think it was Richard was in the movie. To be honest, I, I for the longest I just thought Richard was Brad until they until they showed Brad in the helicopter, and I was like, oh, okay, there's Brad. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, Raccoon City is a small town. It's not a city. It's it's something that's just a weird change. I don't know why they did that. It would have been better if they kept it as a city. So that way it felt more overrun with the zombies. Uh, which the zombies were a complete letdown in the city. Um, but they were really fun to watch in the mansion. Which we'll get to. Uh, Jill and Wesker are apparently dating. And uh, that's a thing. Uh, Chris... After Claire left, was raised by William Birkin, which is, I, I I don't even know how what to say about that because we don't really spend a whole lot of time uh, building their relationship together. So I I wasn't sure how to take that, and until like the end of the movie, it doesn't really come up too much again, and even then, it has no emotional impact because you don't really see Chris and Birkin really interacting together it's it's just a weird thing and that that's kind of a a recurring problem throughout this movie uh same thing with with jill and wesker like they're talked about being you know dating and you see their interaction in the diner and then outside of that there's not really much there to build on that relationship um sherry's in the movie like i mentioned and she has a dream of a hunter so that's cool. We don't ever see a hunter in this movie, but she has a dream of a hunter. So I guess that's an Easter egg. Um, when they get to, uh, what is it? When they get to the whole thing with the, uh, the zombie outbreak happening, they did a good job in building the suspense for it, but it, it was, it was weird because the zombies talk. So when they when the people turn into zombies, they still have some sort of brain function. And because of that, they can still talk and say words and write things. And it's it's just we have we have the obligatory. Oh, I don't need help. You need help from a child thing, which that's that was cool. I mean, that's uh, that's a line out of RE2 remake. That's when Sherry says it to Claire, um, which is fine. Uh, that's that's fine. Uh, we get a child hiding under a table. Claire sees the, the child under the table. And she asks the child, do you need help? And he says, no, I don't need help. You need help. And then a zombie uh, breaks through the window. And that zombie had written itchy tasty on the window. And breaks through the window. Comes attacking Claire. That's the other thing too. Zombies are fast in this. Um, like crimson head fast. But they're not crimson heads. They're still kind of like halfway between people and zombie. Again, very weird. Um, so yeah, once the zombie outbreak starts happening, Chris goes to the RPD to meet up with everybody else to, because there's sirens playing through Raccoon City Town. And Claire takes Chris's motorcycle and drives, I guess, to the RPD as well. Um, but doesn't make it at the same time as Chris. It's very weird. Whatever. Uh, Wesker... Um, gets a pager message that says uh, to check your locker it's time and he's confused at first 
He doesn't know what's going on, or he, maybe he makes it seem like it's not going on. And uh, when he goes and checks his locker, there's a um, there's a handheld computer uh, that's in his locker. And actually, this is a plot point that they take from the novel. So if you ever read uh, The Umbrella Conspiracy, which is the novelization of the first game from S.D. Perry, this is a plot point that's taken from the novel uh, where Jill gets the same kind of handheld Palm Pilot thing. If you guys were around in the 90s, you know what this is. Or if you see the movie, you know what this is. Um, and so her Palm Pilot was given to her by Trent, where in this this movie, uh, the Palm Pilot that Wesker gets is from Ada. But we never see Ada, and he never says her name. He just says she, like, later on when Jill asks him about it, he says, oh, she gave it to me. And, like, he starts explaining everything, which we'll get to that. So Leon is apparently tossed aside by the RPD. Like he's he's the front desk person. And now we're gonna get into like character portrayal for Leon because this is this is where it just it's just ruined for me for Leon's character. Uh Leon is portrayed as reckless and careless. He's just kind of like um a party boy, I don't care kind of mood or whatever. And he's asleep at his job, and he's asleep at the desk, at the front desk. And apparently he doesn't hear a large tanker come and blow up in front of the doors. I I don't I don't know. I mean those headphones are not uh they're not noise canceling, especially back in the nineties. Um so yeah, he's he's a mess. Chief Irons during the whole outbreak thing, uh he tells Alpha Team, go look for Bravo team, that he sends him over to the Spencer mansion. And um and so then when the whole outbreak starts happening. Chief Irons saves Leon's life uh, from a burning zombie, which was the uh, the tanker driver or the you know the the truck driver. And then Chief Irons packs his stuff up and decides he's going to leave the RPD, leaving Leon as the only cop in the uh, in the RPD. Which again, this is not why I said that's a small town and it's a small RPD, small police station. So they they paint it. You know, a pretty picture on the outside. It looks like the RPD from the game. And then when you go on the inside, it looks like the RPD from the game, like the front hall. But then everything else, the star's office, everything else is really small. Like you would see in like a small police station in a very, very small town. So it's not the RPD that we know from the the games. It's not a grand scale ma um, museum that's been turned into the RPD. Nothing like that. So, yeah, that's that's all good and well, I guess. Um, so Alpha Team goes to the Spencer Estate. They find the Jeep that the Bravo Team took, uh, and has been flipped and damaged and destroyed. And you see Jill being trigger happy and reckless. Like ugh, Jill's character is very unlikable in this movie. I, I, and and that's sad to say because Jill is my favorite Resident Evil character, and she's not likable at all in this movie. Um, she doesn't really do anything in this movie, honestly. Except save Wesker from a crow and then be Wesker's partner as they go through the mansion for like two minutes. So, yeah. Um, so, we have Brad is in the helicopter and we have Richard who is not on Bravo team. He's on Alpha team and so he's with them in the mansion. Um, but again, they they made the mansion look nice, like look like the game. For the most part, I think the mansion honestly was the best set piece. Um, we don't have the intro scene from R from RE One happen. Does not happen. They just find the jeep and walk to the mansion entrance, and that's it. They're they're in the mansion. Um, so yeah, there's no which I guess is fine, but I would have liked to have seen that intro scene um, just because it it builds intensity and and suspense. Um, but you keep in mind this movie is an hour and 40 minutes or something like that. It's everything is rushed in this movie. Uh, we see a, a scene where, and also this, I, if it seems like I'm going back and forth, back and forth, because this is how the movie was, it was like whiplash. The movie doesn't really give you time to process the scenes that you just watched. It, it's like, it's. Five minutes of one scene, cut to another scene, cut to another scene, cut to another scene. So because of the way that the movie is structured, because they're trying to fit in the mansion incident with the uh, 
with raccoon city outbreak all in one day instead of having the mansion incident happen like in the games and then a couple months later the outbreak happens in raccoon city you're you're pushing everything into one movie into a matter of a couple of hours all of this takes place september 30th in a matter matter of a couple of hours so take that how you will september 30th ends october 1st couple of hours the raccoon city outbreak happens as well as the mansion incident happens all together it's a mess we have a scene of chief irons trying to escape raccoon city then we see umbrella corpse uh standing there it's just like two people and they just shoot everybody who's trying to escape and chief irons gets away from the gunfire and we see uh a close-up on one of the one of the umbrella operatives uh, i'm uh, i'm guessing it's supposed to be hunk i don't they never say his name he just looks like hunk but you take that as you will i guess and uh chief irons returns to the rpd with no way to get out now we get to the dogs right so the dog incident in the police station uh the police station garage so chief irons comes back he goes into the garage he we hear the dog a suspense starts to build a little bit and then we see the dog and it's really bad cgi like really bad um we get a shot of the zombies trying to break into the gate for the rpd and they're talking saying let us in let me in let me in uh, I, it's it's just weird to see zombies that talk it, it's just not so scary to me it's it's scarier or more intense when they're just mindless attacking machines or, you know, like it just intelligent zombies are not scary. I'm sorry. Uh, then we, we again, we go from the RPD to then back to the mansion incident and they keep Den uh, Kenneth death scene, which is really cool, but it's not Kenneth. It's Enrico, but it's just it's a cool scene. I like that they kept it. It was intense. I, it was very, very well done. Probably one of the best looking zombies, too. And, uh, yeah. And then from that moment, all hell breaks loose in the, in the, uh, the mansion and Chris is there and he's got to fight for his life. Um, we see, uh, we see Richard die from a zombie swarm and, uh, and Chris is there just trying to escape shooting all the zombies in his way, um, in a very, very good scene. That's probably the best action scene in the whole movie, to be honest with you. Um, we get uh, we get during that time we get a scene of Wesker with Jill. They randomly walk into a room. Wesker looks at his Palm Pilot, looks at a at a piano, and just starts playing Moonlight Sonata with no rhyme or reason as to any sort of like, hey, yeah, okay, you know, we've been walking for a while through the mansion. No, it's been been like five minutes, and all of a sudden, oh yeah, let me play Moonlight Sonata in this on this piano. It opens up the uh, it opens up a hidden passage which apparently leads to the umbrella lab which is really disappointing um but leads to the umbrella lab and then wesker tells jill about everything how he was contacted by these people who uh who were working against umbrella and they wanted him to steal the stuff that umbrella's been researching and he wants jill to go with him and jill's like no how can you betray us and there's no emotional weight in this at all because we spent like a total of like 10 minutes with Jill and Wesker throughout the whole movie. So there's really no significant emotional weight to Wesker's betrayal at this point. And so during this time or like right before they leave or whatever, the helicopter comes crashing in because uh, Brad got attacked by zombies and got turned into one and he flew the helicopter while a zombie and crashed it into the mansion and jill saves wesker's life and then wesker's like oh come with me jill's like no i don't want to because you can't how can you betray all your friends and yeah so he's that's when he says oh yeah you know she sent me uh all the information and that they're gonna blow up raccoon city uh by 6 a.m and we need to get out of here and jill's like no i can't leave everybody and yeah so wesker's like okay peace i'm out and he runs down the down the hidden passageway and jill uh goes to look for chris so yeah yeah very very quick and random scenes just great then we get a cut scene to uh to leon and claire they're in the armory with chief irons um you know prepping up to uh to escape raccoon city and leon's looking at a shotgun like i don't know how to use this thing 
and Claire takes it and she knows how to use it. Leon's like, oh my God, how did you do that? And Claire's like, oh, because, you know, uh, growing up on your own, you have to learn these things. So Chris didn't teach Claire. Claire was self-taught. Um, Claire is a total badass in this movie, which I don't have a problem with, but it's just very, very weird. And again, we'll get to Claire's character portrayal in a moment here. So we find out that Claire's friend Ben was in the RPD, like locked up in the RPD. And Leon sees him and Ben's like, oh, you need to get me out of here. You can't leave me in here. And there's a zombie that's there or, you know, a person that's turning into a zombie. And uh, Ben steals Leon's gun because Leon doesn't know how to use weapons. Threatens to kill Leon if he doesn't uh, get him out. So Leon's like, okay, let me get the keys. Finds the keys, fumbles with the keys. Oh, I don't know which key it is. Finally opens it up, and then Ben gets attacked by the zombie dude, even though Ben has a gun but can't use it. And then the zombie then comes and attacks Leon, and Leon doesn't know how to use the gun. And uh, Claire comes and saves him, and Claire tells him, you need to get your shit together because, yeah, reasons, you know, we're going to die. And Leon's like, okay. And the zombie comes back up, that Claire shot, and then he, Leon's like, Oh, okay. And starts screaming and shooting the zombie. It's, uh, wow, big, big character arc right there. Uh, we get over to them escaping the RPD, and the zombies finally break into the RPD. And as Claire, Leon, and, uh, and Chief Irons are running, escaping, because Chief Iron knows a way out, because he said that there's a, uh, there's a way to get out that leads to the Spencer mansion where they can then meet up with the Alpha team. Claire apparently has unlimited ammo um, for a shotgun because she doesn't reload until like she does like, I don't know, 10 or so shots in a shotgun that clearly doesn't hold more than two rounds, but whatever. It's it's all good. I mean, I've, I've played Resident Evil where I've had unlimited ammo too. It's fine. It's fun. Okay. So they get to the orphanage and... Um, Claire finds out that Chief Irons was paid off. But all this conversation, this whole conversation happens in the background that you don't even hear it unless you're really paying attention to it. Because at that same moment, Leon, he sees Lisa Trevor. He's like, what the hell is that? Lisa Trevor's telling him to be quiet because there's a liquor there, but he doesn't know that. And so you hear in the background and you got to really be paying attention to it, to be honest, that uh, Claire finds out Chief Irons was paid by Umbrella. Uh, to help with the orphanage, to send kids there for Umbrella to experiment on. And she's like berating him. And then Claire finally notices Leon. And uh, Leon is attacked by the liquor. Claire saves him because Claire, you know, Leon is the damsel in distress in this movie. And then, uh, you know, they're both saved by Lisa Trevor, but not before uh, Chief Irons is killed by the liquor. Which was actually really cool. I, I like how they killed him. It was, it was a, um, it was very reminiscent to, I guess you could say the death of, uh, of one of the RPD members in uh, in RE2 remake, or even by Nikolai from Nemesis, because the way that Chief Irons was hanging and then just falls down. So it was it was a nice nice little death there. So I, I appreciate that death scene. Um, the only problem that I have with Chief Irons is that. They don't really paint Chief Irons as the psychopathic serial killer that he actually is in the games. Again, that's what happens when you're trying to cram too much story into one movie. Uh, so Chief Irons instead is just somebody who's just paid by Umbrella, uh, you know, to, I guess, funnel kids into the orphanage. And that's it. Like, that's all he does. Um, outside of that, he's, you know, just whatever of a character. Kind of just a throwaway character, in my opinion. So Lisa Trevor kills the liquor in probably a really one of the better scenes as well. Uh, she she's fighting the liquor and she's like choking it. And then she gets her uh, her chains on the liquor and just like rips its head in half. It was probably <laughs> I really enjoyed that scene. Really, really did. Um, Lisa then gives Claire the RPD keys while they're in the orphanage. And again, nice Easter egg, I guess, but there's only one key on the RPD keys that actually does anything. And that's, I guess, the heart key, which unlocked the door. So that way they can go to the Umbrella Lab, which I, oh man, it was so weird. So weird. So they unlock the keys to, or they unlock the door to the Umbrella Lab. They go to it and they see where they experimented on all of the children. 
it was nice to see the way that it was laid out because it was it was creepy in a good way and then it goes back to the spencer mansion where chris is like fighting his way through all these zombies and it, again it's a very cool fight scene in the spencer mansion you see a whole bunch of uh, zombies attacking chris and like all the lights are out there's no lighting at all except for the flashes of of the barrel as chris is pulling the trigger shooting all the zombies um so we just get a lot of close-up shots of zombies and chris and it's just it's really it was a really fun moment to watch you know he's shooting with his rifle uh with his assault rifle and then he runs out of ammo switches the handgun and he's, he's shooting fighting the, the zombies with the handgun and then he runs out of ammo and then jill comes to save him which i guess was cool i mean she killed one zombie i think in the whole movie anyways she kills <laughs> she kills one zombie saves chris's life tells chris what's going on that uh, that wesker left them catches him up with everything and uh, then we go back to where Chris or Claire and Leon are, where they they see all the experimentation that was done on the on the children that they were also going to experiment on Chris and Claire. Uh, we see the film reel for the Ashford twins for Code Veronica, where they pull off the uh, the wings from the dragonfly while Code Veronica music plays, which again was a nice Easter egg, and it was a shot for shot remake of that scene where they're pulling off the dragonfly wings even with the ants going to the dragonfly's body and just eating it and the two twins smiling at each other the only difference that they do in the film reel is that they put william birkin in there that he was experimenting on the twins as well so william birkin's involved in, apparently in everything they might as well just put him as the person in charge of umbrella at this point because spencer was mansion for like two seconds uh, we go to William Birkin now where he has he's with his family as they escaped and he's collecting the G virus and you know he's in the umbrella lab Wesker goes to the umbrella lab sees William Birkin and tells him that he he came for the sample he doesn't want to shoot them he doesn't want to hurt them or anything like that William Birkin says no Wesker shoots Birkin Birkin shoots Wesker Birkin injects himself injects himself with the G virus Annette picks up a gun, Wesker kills Annette, Sherry picks up the gun, Wesker threatens to kill Sherry, Jill meets Wesker, shoots Wesker, seemingly killing Wesker, and uh, and then Birkin comes back to life, all mutated and stuff, starts chasing Sherry, Jill, and Chris, because now Jill and Chris have Sherry instead of Claire having Sherry, which is fine, it's not a big deal, it's whatever. Um, it's just, it's weird. Now, let's talk about Wesker's character portrayal. Because there was none. It was like, it was, honestly, it was so much going on in this movie. It's really rattling my brain. And uh, Wesker's portrayal was that he wasn't a good guy nor a villain. But not really an anti-hero either. Because he doesn't do anything that redeems himself. He's just there as a small plot device so Birkin can inject himself. Uh, so mutated Birkin chases Chris and Jill. And apparently Birkin has control of himself in this version. As opposed to a mindless Birkin. Which is okay. It's fine. Um, Chris and Jill are... Yeah, Chris and Jill separate. Jill goes off with Sherry. Chris is being hunted by Birkin as Birkin now starts, uh, you know, we get that references between Birkin raising Chris. Um, so, yeah, Chris is look like he's about to die and in comes Claire. Claire saves him. <sighs> and then they all go to the train. All right. So Chris, Jill, Sherry, Leon. Did I miss anybody? Chris, Jill, Sherry, Leon, and Claire all go to the train. And uh, Birkin starts to mutate. And immediate go immediately goes to stage three. And uh, as they're escaping on the train, he breaks into the train. He starts beating up Chris. And he grabs Claire. Claire stabs Birkin in the face with a knife. And Leon gets a rocket launcher from nowhere. And apparently he knows how to use it now. 
because he didn't know how to use weapons before. But he knows how to use a rocket launcher, so he takes a rocket launcher and shoots Birkin. And then Raccoon City gets blown up. They escape. And uh, cut to the credits. There's a mid credit scene, though, that has another Easter egg for the remake of Resident Evil, where if you leave the game running, like the, the very intro scene, not the, not the intro to the game once you start playing, but the intro scene where the zombie comes up on the body bag and then you hear a gunshot and it dies. Uh, we get that as the mid credit scene and the body bag starts moving and Wesker's in the body bag. And uh, out of the body bag, like you see him, he's fidgeting and like he's in pain because he's been injected or, you know, something is in him. And, um, and then we get Ada walks out because why not? And Ada says that she kept Wesker alive. She saved him because they still need him or whatever. And Wesker's saying, it's too bright. I can't see anything. And Ada's like, oh, here, these will help. And gives Wesker his sunglasses. And that's that's the movie. All right. So now that we've discussed the story in depth, we can let everybody else back in. Uh, before we continue, I'm going to talk about the characters specifically. Now, we did talk briefly about the characters in relation to the story. But there will be no story spoilers moving forward. We're just going to break down each character as to the issues that I have with the characters and what they did good with the characters or what I felt they did well with the characters. Um, so let's start off with the easiest one to do, Chris Redfield. I felt like Chris Redfield, they, they nailed it with his personality. They nailed it with his look, like he looked the part. Robbie Amell, I, I've, I've said before and I said in the beginning of this video and I've, I've said it throughout, Robbie Amell I think was the perfect casting choice for Chris Redfield. They did a phenomenal job making him look the part. And he just felt like Chris Redfield overall. There's really not much to say in that. Just because the way that the the movie plays out. It just overall doesn't really give you that character uh, progression or interaction. Because it's a very rushed movie. Um, so yeah. I, I felt like they did Chris Redfield justice. The way that they portrayed him. Let's talk about Claire. I have some problems with Claire. Um. First things first is Claire is, I mean, she's not true to her character at all. That is not Claire Redfield. Not not those who grew up playing the games. And I say this because the Claire Redfield that they're portraying in this movie is Resident Evil 2 remake Claire Redfield, not the original Claire Redfield. Because Claire Redfield in the beginning, when she first got introduced into RE2, was a college student. She had some weapon training from Chris, but nothing really... Uh, substantial she wasn't the badass that she portrays in the movie and it's not until in my opinion Resident Evil Revelations 2 where she actually becomes that full-on no uh, you know no holds bar action hero Claire it, so even in Code Veronica she's not even at that point because in Code Veronica she still has to be rescued by Chris so she can't really fully take care of herself even though she is capable of it but she doesn't get to that point just yet. Where in this movie, because it's following along remake uh, Claire Redfield, she's just a no-nonsense, straightforward, straight-to-the-point Claire Redfield uh, who basically saves the day. Um, you know, and I say that in a sense that, like, because she's just action hero Claire Redfield. Uh, so... Yeah, I mean, as far as her look, she looks like Resident Evil 2 Remake Claire Redfield. Everything about her is RE2 Remake Claire Redfield. That's that's what she is. Everything about her. Uh, there's nothing that is even remotely similar to OG RE2 or Code Veronica uh, Claire. And even Revelations 2 Claire, it's just not there. We don't see... Uh, any of the traits whatsoever that we're that we're used to when it comes to Claire as a character. Um, now, do I really have a problem with her being action hero Claire? Not at all. I mean, this movie honestly is Claire's story. It's not really anybody else. Um, and so I'm okay with that. I don't have a problem with that. My my issue comes into play is that this is Alice version 2.0, pretty much, and. You see that in if you watch the second Wes Anderson movie, 
uh, or Wes Anderson, um, Paul Anderson. I don't know why I said Wes Anderson, Paul Anderson. Uh, so Resident Evil Apocalypse, I think Apocalypse is the second one. I don't, I really don't remember. Anyways, if you watch the second Resident Evil movie from the Paul Anderson movies, um, Claire from this movie is very similar to Alice from that movie, just without the special powers. So let's go to Wesker. Wesker, they, if they tried to make him likable, but there's not enough screen time to actually really feel that. So it kind of falls flat. And the interactions that we get with Wesker is limited to Jill, where in the games, it his interaction is more so with Chris. Uh, they build a sort of rivalry in a sense where Chris wants to uh, basically kill Wesker because of everything that he's done in the games. But in this movie, we don't get that at, at all. It, there's, they don't build to any sort of uh, relationship as far as, you know, Chris looks up to Wesker, nothing. There is nothing of that in this in this uh in this movie um the whole relationship with wesker is just built around jill and it's not even well done we get one interaction really in the beginning of the movie uh of them being on a date at the diner and then that's really it uh, so because of that like the eventual betrayal and again not this isn't really spoilers because we know wesker's character it'd be a spoiler you know if i said oh you know he turned good or whatever but the eventual betrayal is just left flat because there was no buildup, no real buildup between the characters to the point where it's if it hurts, you know, it hurts the characters immensely. The characters don't really feel that um, you get that a little bit from Jill, but it's not really so much. So I don't think they really did Wesker justice in this movie. Maybe in the sequel, I don't know. It's just the character wasn't well written. And that's what happens when you try to cram too much into one movie, into one story. Uh, now, Jill's character is a complete train wreck. I, I don't recognize her as Jill. She's not Jill. Okay, only by name and by color scheme. And by color scheme, I mean the colors that she's wearing is blue. And that's typically what we see Jill wearing in the games. But outside of that, this is not Jill at all there is nothing that resembles jill in her personality in her writing in the acting nothing and it's a shame because this actress is a very very good actress she she could do wonders with the character of jill if given the right material and they just did not write jill properly again it just has to do with cramming too much into one movie and it just falls completely flat and it's unfortunate it's very unfortunate because this is this is the type of thing that if they had focused on the mansion incident first, then they could have built on that. And then, you know, the second movie would have been Raccoon City and that would have involved Jill, Leon and Claire. But because they just did everything together, it just it falls flat for those characters. We have Chief Irons, which I think Chief Irons was done really well. Um, you know, they uh, they don't go as crazy as they do in the games where he's a serial killer in this. Um, so they got rid of that story element, which I think fits well. And the way that they portrayed Chief Irons, I think they did it a very, very well adaptation of his character. Uh, his character is a cowardly character where he only really cares about himself and uh, he does do shady things. And that's captured and portrayed well. But again, because too much story, it really just... The delivery of it, it just falls flat and really to the wayside of everything else. Lisa Trevor, honestly, doesn't really do much for the story. She looks cool. Her design is done really well. I really like her design. Um, when I first saw her in the trailers, it didn't really stick out. But seeing her in the movie, like they did a good job with Lisa Trevor. But they didn't really do much with her. They got rid of her backstory with uh, with her dad and everything else. And they only give you little snippets here and there of, w of what they've done with Lisa. But if you're not paying attention to it, then you completely miss it. But other than that, like she's not she's not a, a villainous character, which is which is fine because in the game, she's not a villainous character either. She's lost her mind because of all the experiments that's been done on her in the games. And the only thing she can see is her mom. That's what she wants. She just wants to be reunited with her mother. So Lisa Trevor in the games is not a villainous character. 
uh, but she just she's crazy because of all the experiments and everything that she's been going through. And so kind of in the same sense, they kept that in the movie where she's not a villainous character at all. Instead, she's she's there to assist the characters. And I'm OK with that. I don't have a problem with that because Lisa Trevor, her story in the games is really lore building. And unless you're really paying attention to it, you really you, you don't know really what's going on. All you see is just another monster. But there's really more to Lisa Trevor's story in the games. And this movie, while it doesn't really go deep into stuff like that, I mean, uh, I'm OK the way that they did it. And the way that they just made her as kind of like a just a side character to just assist the main characters of the movie. Now let's get to Leon. Leon, I think, is the worst character in this entire movie. The way that they wrote him is horrendous. He is basically just there for comic relief. He does nothing at all for the story. Like if you removed him from this from the entire movie, nothing would change at all he does absolutely nothing in the entire movie he's a bumbling idiot he he's not even a rookie cop they call him a rookie because he's new to the to rpd he's new to raccoon police station and that's it i mean he got transferred from another station because of his dad and that's really it the only thing that they've kept of leon in relation to his character in the game is how OG Leon, the original Leon, was kind of portrayed as like a party boy because he was young and this and that. And the reason why he was late to Raccoon uh, on his first day was because he drank too much and he overslept. And that's why he was late and arrived right after the zombie outbreak. Where in the movie, they kind of kept that party boy out, uh, you know, details, but in this kind of way like they just made it seem like he was just drinking because he was bored since he was in raccoon city and nothing was going on and he's just he's a mess of a character even worse than jill is like at least jill has stuff to do in the movie where leon doesn't do anything at all and it's a real shame because leon's such a beloved character and they just wipe their butts with him and it's a real, real shame. William Birkin, I I think is fine. The way that they rewrote his character, I think is okay. My issue is that he doesn't have that relationship with Wesker. But they intertwined William Birkin's story much more into the lore for this movie than, than he has in the overall lore for the games. So I'm okay with that. That doesn't really... It doesn't really bother me so much, to be honest with you. Um, I thought it would bother me more, but as I thought about it after watching the movie, I'm like, you know, it's he's okay. I I just I just feel like again, he's a product of too many storylines going on, too many things going on, and it, as a character, he just kind of falls flat because again, not enough screen time for for a character like William Birkin. And then Sherry's in the movie, but. She didn't do anything. She's she's there. Sherry's there. Which is fine. That, that's fine. So my thoughts overall for the game, or game for the movie. Uh, if you, if you want to just enjoy a decent action movie, and I say decent, liberally, it's, it's okay. You can watch it as an action movie. You have a good time. I, there were a lot of action scenes that I enjoyed in the movie. Um... As a zombie movie, it's it's okay. It's it's not, you know, Dawn of the Dead. It's not Shaun of the Dead. It's not, you know, Night of the Living Dead. Nothing nothing like that. It's not 28 Days Later. But it's okay. I mean, it's, it's all right. It's not, eh. As a Resident Evil movie, it's bad. It's really bad as a Resident Evil movie. Um, I, I said this in my Discord. And if you're not a part of my Discord, join the Discord down below. There's a link. I said this in my Discord when people were asking me about it. Um, look, I'm going to be honest. The first two Paul Anderson movies were better because they focused really on just a couple of characters. You know, Alice, Rain, um, the, the 
guy who was Alice's husband and then the other dude. I re it's been a while since I watched the movie. Yeah. But, you know, like they because they focus on those four characters mostly, like it gives enough time to build the story with these characters with those characters and build the overall story because it's on one location, which is the mansion and uh, and nest, which is underneath the mansion. So it gives time for all of that story to build on itself. And then we get to the reveal at the end where Alice is by herself uh, and Raccoon City's been overrun and it looks deserted. And then we get to Resident Evil 2 or, you know, the second movie. And again, it's done better because it's focusing again on Alice. And now we get the introduction of of, uh, of Carlos. We get the introduction of, of Jill, LJ. And because it's focusing on those characters, it does a good job as far as the way that the story progresses with the with the movie it doesn't mean it's a fantastic movie but it's it's a decent enough adaptation of the second and third game where it works in that sense where this movie because they cram so much into it it doesn't work you're the way that they they do the storytelling the whole overall uh outbreak and the mansion incident everything is t it's happening within a couple of hours and from september 30th to october 1st and it doesn't give enough time to build any sort of real lore for the movie especially if they're moving forward it doesn't really build any sort of uh, character progression any sort of real relationships with these characters and it's it's really a lot of fan service which is kind of done well but not like it's a lot of easter egg hunting that the only really the only real way to hunt for all the easter eggs is to have like a digital copy of the movie or like have your home uh, you know the home release of the movie and then be able to like pinpoint all of the easter eggs and then just that's it um other than that it's a really bad resident evil movie and you know People ask me if they should go see it. I would wait till it's on streaming somewhere or home release or something. So you don't have to pay a bunch of money to, you know, take you and your girlfriend or whatever to go watch the movie. I would rather go watch Ghostbusters again because Ghostbusters was phenomenal. Um, I, I, I mean, when you when you come down to a movie like this and you, you just cram so much into it, it's going to have problems. It really is. And no amount of Easter eggs is going to fix that. Uh, but if you did watch it and you enjoyed it, that is awesome. I'm not going to take that away from you because there's no there's no problem with enjoying a movie. You know, like there were scenes and parts of the movie that I thoroughly enjoyed. But overall, as a Resident Evil movie, it just didn't work. They could have take they could have taken this movie and called it something else, changed the characters to different names, and it would have been fine uh, as a zombie movie. But as a Resident Evil movie, and I have to judge it as a Resident Evil movie, it doesn't work. So let me know your thoughts and opinions down below in the comment section. Be nice to each other. People like the movie. That's awesome. More power to you. Um, personally, I'm not going to watch it again until home release. And then probably break down all the Easter eggs just so I can see how many Easter eggs are in the movie. Because there's a lot of them. And you can't really you can't really get all of them because it's just too much. So thank you for watching. I appreciate it. And I hope you enjoyed the gameplay footage of Resident Evil Remake. Um, until next time, guys. Happy gaming. I was really disappointed in this movie.